well, then it wasn't for you. Everyone it's doesn't do well, money, which is why no people. one posts their public results, including Tone. If everyone I was making post. money, they would brag about their balances, but no one does because it's the most dangerous thing I you can do in crypto. I don't it's think literally I like smoking crack. It. You guys are selling courses on how to smoke crack better. And saying no, maybe smoking crack's not for you. It's it's not a waste of money, but it's a waste of money. Guys, uh, so we'll go. Guys, everyone, run. So so James, I'll let you go, and then Wendy, and then NFT God, and then we'll kick off the debate because we weren't planning to talk about technical analysis, but it is a hot topic. A lot of people are interested in technical analysis, and we've got some great technical analysts in the on the stage. I'm not one of them, that's for sure. But yeah, James, what are your thoughts on the point made by Richard, Wendy, then NFT God, and then and then we'll we'll kick off the debate and announce it. Um, I, I show my trades every day in my videos with my account. So I have like, I'm trading with $1 million of real US dollars in, in my account every single day on my videos for free. And I teach everyone, I show them what I'm doing with my money through TA. You can watch my videos on YouTube. Um, I do have a course as well that's quite popular. It's like 6,500 students taking the course. Uh, it's $333. But I, I do that because I've been trading for 21 years. And you said you said something before that, um, there's all these Wall Street bankers that make, they don't actually make much money because they wouldn't be working a job if they were amazing traders. They wouldn't be working for someone. I haven't worked for someone for my entire life almost. At 14 years old, I started doing technical analysis on MetaTrader. Um, so I've been doing it for 21 years. And it's kind of, it's a less you can learn it and it's an art form and it's experience. So, but why I think it's very important that everyone should learn it is you all, everyone has money. Everyone's invested in Facebook. Everyone's invested in Bitcoin here. I'm assuming everyone's invested in something. And if you don't learn basic TA, you're just, you're just moving with the markets. If the, if, if Netflix goes up a hundred percent, beautiful, but then it drops 70%. And if you don't know basic TA or any TA, you're just, you're just moving with the entire market and you just lose 70% of your money. And I learned that lesson multiple times in 2017, I had a big portfolio that just got wiped out by by Bitcoin and like the big drop. And that's hard to predict, but I'm saying learning TA is not a bad thing in any way. And you have to, you have to tie it in with like learning everything. And Tony Bays is, and he, he gathers a lot of people here at the financial summit where he was on November 11th. That was the day I called the top in the room with Tony Bays and everyone. But um, Tony Bays is an excellent trader and he teaches a lot of people amazing stuff and everyone can learn it. Before it was a very few select people that could learn technical analysis. That's what's really amazing. Like. Now everyone can learn it. So there's endless YouTube videos, free content, there's courses, there's books. Again, read technical analysis for financial markets. It's the Bible of TA. And it's very important that everyone learn it. Wendy, what, what real, 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 real quick, real, go, real, go quick real quick, real quick, real quick. Real uh, quick. Thanks for the shout out, James. I'm actually going to join with the financial summit uh, telegram handle as uh, the telegram, uh, YouTube handle. Twitter handle as well. Uh, but real quick, here's how fundamental analysis can get your portfolio in a lot of trouble. I was a TA guy, but then in 2005, I used too much fundamental analysis in my realization that the real estate market was a giant, over ridiculous mess. And I started shorting the real estate market in early 2006 constantly. And I ran out of money. I was a trader and I ran out of money due to my fundamental analysis of shorting the share of real estate six months too early. I ran out of money shorting real estate uh, in the beginning of 2007. In February 2007, I had to go get a job. That job was at Bear Stearns because I basically blew up my portfolio constantly shorting home builders and real estate. And then I, within a year, year and a half, the entire company, Bear Stearns, went collapsed because of the real estate crash. So just because you have good fundamental analysis and you understand what's going on in the markets, doesn't mean you can time the trade. I should have trusted my TA better and kept longing as it kept going higher and higher and higher, okay? And um, on that quick note that Richard says, yeah, I did call a top at 7,500 in Bitcoin in 2017. The reason for that is, is because I was bullish from about $700 all the way to $7,000 within nine months. And to me, that looked like Bitcoin was ready to top. And while I was off on the price, I was wrong on time by about two weeks because two weeks later, the top came. And I did go back to being a bull once it broke above eight and a half thousand because of TA. But at that point, I kept saying, yeah, it's an exponential rise. So while you can make fun of it that I did call the top for the year, I only missed it by two weeks. Granted, the price went up, doubled in two weeks, but that's what happens in FOMO, and this is why these things are hard to predict. But ultimately, 
we went way lower than seven and a half thousand. Uh, we went all the way down to three. Yeah, I called the top at 20 and everyone got long the bottom to get their free hex airdrop, which was worth like half a billion. You know, as the richest guy on this chat, I just think it's funny that the snake oil salesmen <laughs> that have day jobs selling you snake oil are, and, oh. and like, I just, I don't, if you would have bought coins instead of playing the stock market, you would have made more money. If you would have bought coins instead of buying trading programs, you would have made more money. If you would have bought coins instead of going to conferences, you would have made more money. I've been in Bitcoin since 2011. And I got to tell you, when I went to the Bitcoin conference in Amsterdam in 2013, hey, that $1,300, $1,400, I wish I'd bought coins with it. It's, it's just so stupid to give other people your money when you can just buy the thing that they're trying. But you know who makes all the money in crypto? The exchanges. The that, where do you the, think the they get their the money from? Direct the traders. Money. All the guys that the guys that make the most money are the guys that just create their own tokens out of thin air and sell it to stupid people. So we you mean Satoshi? Are you talking about Satoshi right, about Satoshi right, guys, right now? Be, oh my god! We'll be guys. Guys, we'll be going through the debate in, in about two minutes. I want to give Wendy the, the mic and then NFT God to just get your final perspective on this. I think a lot of people in the audience we've got over three thousand listeners. I see Brett just joined. Brett, there's a schedule change. We're going to do the debate first before NFT hour. So we've got over 3,000 people listening live. We had 75,000 people last week. So I think it's going to be a pretty interesting debate um, and very educational. But Wendy, I know you've been waiting for a while. Thank you for your patience. I'll give you the mic to give us your final take on the subject and then NFT God and then winner announcement and kick it off. There's just a whole lot of big dick swinging energy in here. Oh, <laughs> yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Lord, have, it's gonna... Lord have mercy, y'all. Anyways, <laughs> l listen, listen. It do I, I don't care what people do. If you figure out a strategy that works for you, fantastic. Do it. There are so many free technical analysis courses online. You don't have to pay for one. If you want to pay for one, pay for one. But when Tone was talking about how he spent, I believe it was $8,000, you know, years and years ago for a technical analysis course, let's face it. College education to get a piece of paper, a degree, costs a lot more than paying for a technical analysis course. And let me tell you something. I have a freaking degree that I got just to, just to have one. I don't use my degree. Most people I know that have degrees don't use it. I'm not telling you not to go to college. I have three, Wendy. I have three of those pieces of paper. Insane. Do you use them? Well, I, I did. Uh, well, uh, I did when I worked on Wall Street. It was financial engineering, but not anymore. Yeah, but it did help me understand finance. So, well, sort of. It didn't really help me. It helped me get a job. It didn't actually teach me anything. Okay, Guys, the cost what... is not the cost of the course. The cost is you losing all of your money trying to do the stupid stuff the course teaches you. You're teaching but... people how to smoke crack Richard, better. They get Richard, wrecked. We, can't, we can't all be gods like you, okay? Please. Please. Let people... Ah. The thing is, I understand what you're saying. But if somebody, if, if it works for somebody, that's okay. We shouldn't sit here and say and, and tell people that they can't do what they want to do. We're in crypto for a reason. We're in crypto because we want to improve our quality of life. We want, to, we want to have a better life. We want to kind of break away from these third-party oppressive entities. So if somebody is utilizing a little bit of technical analysis and utilizing networking or whatever it is, and they're able to do really well for themselves, just as long as it's done ethically, there's no problem with but, it. But it's you're it. saying, first of all, it's not ethical. When you win in a trade, you're taking someone else's money that wish you didn't have it. Instead, you could provide a good or service and get their money honestly. That's not and they how want trading you to works. That is, not, not that, how, that, that is, that that is a lie. That, that is not how that, trading that, works. Would go the yeah. same with your, but you have, okay, for example, you have a project, you have a coin. It would be the same, it would be type of the, the similar type of ethics with that too. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you're doing is wrong or right. This is your You opinion, can't say I'm in the same it. breath you're trying to get rid of middlemen and then enrich the middlemen. The exchanges that get rich on all of you guys getting liquidated, then experimenting, then get OTC rich because yes. you're promoting them. You're promoting them. You're promoting these guys that are getting wrecked on 50x leverage, 20x leverage, 3x I, leverage. People don't realize 3x somebody, leverage is a lie. I have never in my life told somebody to use 50 times leverage. On my channel, we talk about very safe practices. If you, I, always, I have said it time and time again until I'm fucking blue in the so face. What's so what's safe to, leverage? Richard, Richard, Tell me what talking? safe leverage is. Let, Let me finish Richard, Richard, talking. Let me ahead, finish talking. Ahead. Thank you. Because because guess what? I am not some docile female that will sit here and get bodied by any of you, okay? Let me tell you something. We talk about safe practices. If, you, if you're not an experienced trader, you have no business using leverage. None at all. And we advocate 
for people that do want to get started with leverage trading, use the demo account. If you can do well on a demo account, then go ahead and try it. But that's your business. I don't see why anybody would want to use more than two to three times leverage. It makes absolute no sense to me. And you can do just as well trading if you're using spot. That's fine with me too. But all I'm saying is, is we shouldn't sit here and dictate what other people do with their money and how they spend their time. I respect Richard. I respect Tone. I respect Mario. I respect everybody speaking in this chat. But what I don't like is I don't like the bullying and I don't like other people telling other people what they can and can't do with their time. But you just told them that. You just told them not to take leverage. Kumbaya, my lord. Because you shouldn't, because it's not, because you shouldn't take, you shouldn't take 50 times leverage. It's fucking stupid. Like, no, but you just said don't use way. leverage at all unless you're advanced. You're controlling people, so it's okay when you do it, so, but it's not so, okay when I do it. You should go ahead can and you, use 100 times you, leverage, okay? Thank you. Can you guys so, Richard, we should we should ask you about what is going to happen go next and just leave that yeah, I'll, I'll technical and listen yeah, shit behind I'll, because I'll, we are here for the future and we want to learn about more predictions that are what is going to do Bitcoin next. Uh, so... Yeah, I will appreciate that. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. I think that the debate about technical analysis, and I think we have NFT God. I'm going to give you the mic as well to have your piece. Um, I think it's a good debate to be had. Obviously, uh, uh, trying to, to respect everyone's opinion. I would say, and, and NFT God, before I give you the mic, I'd say like I was a guy that was anti courses for a long time, but not anti education. What I mean by this is, there's people that sell courses, just sell shit, and they don't care about giving value to their audience just for the sake of selling. That's how they make money. And you got, you got those gurus. I'm not going to name them. But I know there's room for education. There's room for courses. And there's room for telling people objectively you know, how technical analysis works without saying this is the solution. This is the way to make a million dollars. So if you say, hey, this is technical analysis. It helps you time the market. But you cannot just purely do technical analysis and become a millionaire. There's room for this. But we don't want courses that say, hey, if you do my course, you're going to become a millionaire through technical analysis. And this is how I made 1,000x using technical analysis. I'm against that. So I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, and if you got, I'd love to get your take because I know you're on the, on the yeah. more against yeah. technical analysis. Do, would you agree with me? Like somewhere in the middle is the right place. And there's, Mario, there's no, I completely right. agree. I completely agree with everything you just said. I just like to talk real quick for 45 seconds uninterrupted because I'm sure this might annoy some people. But TA is important. It should be like the sixth most important skill you have, right? A lot of the snake oil salesmen on YouTube and on this stage who are going to charge you 500 bucks for a course, they're going to tell you, learn this. Look at me. I'm rich. I got a jet. You're going to make all this money too by buying this course. It's important to know, it's like the sixth most important skill. If you want to learn it, send me a DM. I'll give you all the resources for free, but please do not spend $400 on a course. Just question why someone who's getting so rich off TA is charging you money. I'm happy to teach it to you for free. Thank you. Well, I, I, so I want to add to you on my channel, I don't have any paid services. I don't have any paid courses. I always direct people to investopedia.com because it was 100% free and the amount of alpha that's on that website is astounding. I also have a free technical analysis guide. You guys need that too. And I, if, but the thing is, is I don't, I think some people do need to pay for particular courses. And if it's something that's not absolutely crazy, sometimes people need guidance and they need more than just reading or watching or whatever it is. And I think that it's great NFT God that you would be willing to help people and do like one-on-one -on -one stuff. That's fantastic. But we do have to take into consideration that sometimes people do need additional help. They have questions. They need, they need, you know, they need things that are answered to them and that's okay. But I don't feel like so there's some courses that are absolutely so, stupid so, and crazy. So real, but again, I, so, I, Tom, so real quick, so, I have never Tom, seen before, anyone, before. I have never seen anyone in my life learn how to trade equity options for free and not lose all their money. I have never uh, seen that. Tastytrade.com has I, all, all the free resources. I would, I would say, guys, so, I'm, to learn that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go somewhere free. in the middle, Tone. Uh, NFT God, let me know if you agree. So, Wendy, first, I just fell in love with you today. Just for the record, and I think a lot of you have 3,000 people. A lot of people would agree. I love your energy and appreciate you being here and, and having that. Man, you're, you're, you're strong. <laughs> Respect. Um, now, I want to go somewhere in the middle. I've never sold a course in my life. I used to have a video called Fuck Paid Courses, but that's more for clickbait. Um, I would say there's a lot of great free stuff. There's also a lot of shit that's available for free. There's a lot of great paid stuff and there's a lot of shit uh, that, that's paid. Now, I think most education could be, you, you could get, you could learn most things for free. Again, most things, 
But when you pay for something, it does force you to apply it and to really learn it as long as you pay for the right thing. So I think there's somewhere in the middle, as long as the price is not just ridiculously high. I remember some guru, I think he's like Wolf of Wall Street, who was selling a course with some other random guy in the UK, another, another like an influencer. Um, Brian, okay, okay, Brian, Brian fucking Brian what's his name? Uh, Brian Rose I like I don't I don't attack a lot of these gurus and some of them I know personally but Brian Rose drives me fucking nuts um, but they sell so the course for forty thousand dollars about how to trade crypto that's bullshit I think a few hundred dollars is fine as long as you're you're educating the right thing now, but it depends I know some of you might... it, it, it depends on the quality but like everybody can actually agree on the correlation between price and course completion rate so like I had like offers that are like available for one dollar like. 1% of people like completed it and it, like it had so much like quality and value whereas uh the 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 boot camp which is again $289 right it's like the, the 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 completion rate is a little bit higher so there is a bit of a correlation with regards to completion rate and price from the aspect of skin in the game guys we can ahead, sell I, courses I, I, as nfts and the floor price right. will hold the founders accountable Oh, Brett, you, you got you got some no sorry so Brett I've got a lot of respect for you Brett and I know I know there's some gurus that just sell shit and I know so for anyone for the record we've done a lot of due diligence on Brett I'm definitely not one of those people so I just want to just make it clear so Brett it's going to be a very heated panel first I appreciate you being here I want to get your take on paid versus unpaid education and then we're going to move to the debate I see a lot of great speakers that are muting their mic that have opinions on this um, and I appreciate you for muting your mic and, and giving everyone a chance to speak before we kick off the debate. I think the audience appreciates it. We're almost at 3,000 people. But my question to you, Brett, since you're in here, is, is with that, you know, I, I know the utility of NFTs as courses. I know some people would not like the idea initially. Um, it, it, Brett doesn't mean it as a cash grab because I know that might sound as such before we eat him alive. But Brett, I want to get your thoughts on paid versus unpaid education because you've educated a lot of people through your YouTube videos for free. And you've been there since the early days. Um, and then you've also launched an NFT that allows people access to your course. So it's like instead of paying for a course, you buy an NFT that gives you access. It's like a, a different way to sell a course and allow people, to, like a book, like a textbook at a, at a university, that NFT represents a textbook. And then once you learn the course, you can actually sell it again to someone else and they can learn it. So you don't end up losing as much money. If anything, make more money. If the, the price of the NFT goes up, there's more demand for your course. So I'd love you to touch on that concept. Um, and then we can kick off the debate that everyone is, uh, is, is waiting for. Yeah, so as far as paid courses go, you do need to incentivize the smartest people. I'm not calling myself one, but just in general, the smartest, most talented people in their field to spend their time educating others. Like, let's just be rational here. And secondly, selling a course as an NFT is the most consumer friendly way to do it while also holding that person accountable because there's a floor price associated with what they're teaching and the information in their course. Currently, we see gurus selling a dream Lambo in their ads saying this course will make you millions, buy my $1,500 course, you buy it, it's shit, and you're shit out of luck. If you sell access to a course as an NFT, you can buy the NFT, use it to token gate the information, learn the information, talk to your favorite guru, and then once you have the skills you need, you can then sell the NFT. And then the goal for the actual project founder would be to balance supply with the demand they're facing. And so it doesn't have to be a limited collection where it's only a thousand. It can be slightly inflationary, where if you like perfectly balance the supply with the demand, the floor price should be stable. And just the idea that you can pay for the course, access it, and then sell it to get your investment back to actually start that skill is a really beautiful concept to me. That's thank nice you, what thank you, could you. You could just put a percentage on the transactions. So the that's exactly what the I did. Course seller, Brilliant, right? Yeah, that's a smart idea. Um, I, I just Brilliant. saw. So and then if people like message. your course, then they're they're going to be selling. The message I sent you is a joke, Mario. The message I sent you is a joke. Don't oh, okay. don't, don't, don't announce this. You're gonna be. Oh, about, oh, okay, okay. Oh, okay, man, you gotta be careful with jokes. Tone, I'm trying to bring you back up. I know that that um, Twitter just glitched. So you should be up any minute. Let us know if you... Oh, you're yep, up. All I'm right, back. so KK, what's up, man? All right, so first, it was a great debate for everyone. We're going to... The debate was about technical analysis for anyone that just joined. There's going to be two giveaway winners that are either... I think they were just announced on, on Telegram. So to win, you know, we do $10,000 in giveaways every week. And you have to be in the space. You have to be listening in the space. Um, you have to join the communities on Telegram and Discord. We announced them there because, you know, I don't want to 
just you know kind of kind of break the flow of the discussion. We will kick off the debate that everyone's anticipating, and KK will introduce that debate. So what we did is we got some of the best people in, on the panel right now to discuss different topics. We're going to kick it off with talking about Bitcoin, the pros and cons, um, and then crypto. Trying to look at things from different lenses. We're going to have a lot of different perspectives. We're going to try to keep it respectful and educate the audience. We had 75,000 people listen to that discussion last week where we touched on the pros and cons of NFTs and Bitcoin versus other blockchains. Funny enough, Tone, is that um, right after the space, um, one of the big NFT whales launched a collection, if I got my facts right, on Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain. And we had other NFT artists start to do that, which was uh, interesting to see. Um, and I think um, KK was researching the topic. But um, yeah, KK, do you want to introduce to the audience the, the debate that everyone's waiting for? Um, and then to the panelists that are on here, what we're going to be debating. And, and by the way, we can take it any way the conversation flows. If we want to move on to NFTs and get this different perspectives, we can do that afterwards as well. Yeah, 100%, 100%. So um, we basically sort of flipped the agenda and we're going to go with the great Bitcoin debate first, uh, considering the speakers and the panelists that we have live with us right now. Mario, do you want to do a quick giveaway shout out right now or you want to skip it? For yeah, after? no, we did it. We did it. We already, gave, we already announced the giveaway winners. So everyone check the pinned tweet. You have to follow all the speakers. Make sure you follow every single one of the speakers, whether they agree with them or not. It's very important, actually. If you don't agree with technical analysis, I want you to follow the people that you know that believe in technical analysis and vice versa. If you believe in technical analysis, I want you to follow the people that are against it, you know, Richard, NFT God, and anyone else. And if you're in the middle, follow everyone because I want you to question everything you believe. I hate echo chambers. That's why we try to get those panels. We try to get different perspectives of things because if we get everyone that believes in Ethereum in a room about Ethereum where everyone loves Ethereum, and they can't understand the, the, the other, they can't see the other side of the coin. Same for Solana. You know, echo chambers, and I've, I've made a tweet about this, are very dangerous. So we try to break that and give different perspectives as objectively as possible. Um, so we announced the winners in the group. Make sure you follow all the speakers, join the communities. Um, and then you will be announcing 10 winners, no, five, five winners, 10, 10 winners um, over the next, uh, uh, you know, throughout the show. And you have to be in the space, you have to share the space. Just check the pinned tweet and you know what to do. Uh, for panelists that are in the audience, we'll be joining, we'll be cycling the panelists as the discussion continues. And we, we always get surprise guests jumping in. Um, we get that every show. We used to get it on Clubhouse as well. So anyone that see that will, is requesting to speak, Romy's just running the room and, and organizing everyone to get the most, to give the most value to the audience and allow the conversation to flow. But KK, I'll let you kick off the debate. I'll let you moderate the debate as well. And we've got great people here. And then panelists, feel free to put your hand up as well whenever you want to jump in um, on a certain point. And we'll try to keep it clean, try to keep interruptions to the minimum. Um, but we'll also let it flow freely as well. So we'll be somewhere in the middle. But KK, I'll let you introduce to the audience, to the 3,000 people listening, over 3,000 people now, um, the debate that we're going to be having today that everyone's been waiting for and everyone's been requesting. 100%. So this all sort of started from the last episode the 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 idea for this debate and it's sort of a, a more specific continuation of the conversations we were having in the last episode as well which you can find on mario's profile so for those that aren't aware uh in the last episode we had a huge debate on bitcoin versus ethereum versus other coins as well with uh huge profiles basically debating either for or against um the topics that we covered were basically around the lines of whether Bitcoin is more centralized than Ethereum, whether the upcoming ETH 2.0 release will fix any of the issues that Ethereum is facing today, and a lot more, but it was basically targeted along those lines. And the, the, the conversation did get a little bit heated at times. Uh, so again, you can find that on Mario's profile. So today, uh, just to sort of combat the heat of the conversation, if it does spiral out of control, we will essentially just mute all. Um, so, so we'll try to do that. So if, yeah, if, it does yeah. come, if it does come to a point of where there's like four different people just shouting at each other, don't take it negatively. We, we seriously appreciate all your opinions and the time that you're taking to actually debate this out. Um, but we will have to mute all and then just essentially reset the conversation just so that we can keep it educational, right? Calm and, you know, humans talking to well, each other. 
But at the same well, time, I know I, I also don't want to just break the flow too much. I want it to be more as, as casual as possible. Um, I also want to thank every one of the speakers. I, I'm going to try to keep my opinions to myself and I try to be as non-binary as possible. Um, and, you know, I have my opinions on certain topics, but I'll try to keep those to myself and get the speakers that, that, that know their shit to talk and give their opinions on the points. But I also want to thank each one of the speakers. You know, Tone didn't have to be here. Richard didn't have to be here. Neither did Wendy, James, GBA, Bullish, NFT God, anyone and all the panelists that are sitting there, Brett, don't have to be here. They took the time to join us. Of course, it's a pretty big audience. So, so reaching a big audience is always a good thing. But also a lot of them enjoy educating you all. So I hope you get value out of this. We're going to pin a tweet allowing you all to ask your questions as well. And you can do it in the Telegram and Discord community. For any panelist, whether you're on stage or you'll be joining the space, we'll be DMing you right now. So the team is going to be DMing you a link to join Telegram and Discord to, to talk to the audience as well in the meantime. So you're a panelist in this space, but you're also a panelist to the Telegram community of 44,000 members and the Discord community launched last week with 8,000 members. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's going to be pretty fun, pretty educative, educative, educational, and uh, pretty exciting as well. So, so okay. Let's kick it off, man. I think it's enough us talking. Can I talk now? Can we go? Let's let's yeah. do it. Yeah, Richard. Uh, let's, uh, uh, let's let's, let's, let's just let, let's just quickly introduce the, uh, the the two protagonists of the debate. So, more specifically, we're gonna have Tone Vase, It was a former Wall Street quant turned Bitcoin maximalist. Debate Richard Hart, who's an ex Bitcoin maximalist turned altcoin founder, who also describes himself as a Bitcoin realist. So we'll kick it off, and I've also pinned the tweet above so that we can track the progress of the debate itself. But we'll kick it off with a question for Richard. So, Richard, first question to you: uh, You were a huge supporter of Bitcoin back in the day, in the day. What has changed? Well, Bitcoin changed. You know, when I first got into it, it was all libertarians and gold bugs that were against the government. Now, over 40% of Bitcoin sits in 2,000 wallets. It's all vulture capitalists. 70,000 Bitcoin sat in the Bitfinex hacker's wallet. Numerous Bitcoin has been seized by the government. So the, the government has seized uh, Ross Ulbricht's uh, Silk Road stash of who knows, 30, 50,000 Bitcoin, whatever it is. Mt. Gox has got 140,000 Bitcoin. So basically, a lot of people that own billions and billions and billions of dollars of Bitcoin are pretty trashy, scummy people. And all they're going to do it is sell it and not have the same political beliefs as you. You know, Blockstream used to have a block size increase on their roadmap, Bitcoin Core. They lied. I and Tone Vase and many other guys fought against the New York agreement where the, gov the, uh, the mining companies tried to take over the protocol. And uh, we were on the same side then. And then uh, we got screwed because Blockstream got bought up by AXA Insurance Company and the founder of, uh, what do you call it, uh, LinkedIn, Ross uh, Reed Hoffman. And, uh, and ha what happened? They started launching cloud mining, centralized cloud mining they wanted to sell you. They started launching protocols that compete with Bitcoin, like the, uh, I don't even remember what they call it, some other network, some other parallel non-Bitcoin network. And so it was just business as usual, centralized scumbags and vulture capitalists taking over. And Bitcoin's roadmap is trash. You want anonymity? Everyone that's tried to be anonymous in Bitcoin has been tracked down and basically killed by the government. So you've got uh, the guys that stole the Finex money. You know why they were sitting on 70,000 Bitcoin still? Because they couldn't get rid of it because you can't get anonymous enough to get out of it. But if you used Bitcoin or if you used Ethereum, you could because you could use Tornado Cash. Guys that hack money in Ethereum actually get to keep their money they stole. But guys that hack money in Bitcoin, they're fucked. They can't get rid of it because you can't get anonymously rid of the shit. And you can't generate yield with it. So everyone gets altcoins to and generate yield and they get wrecked and, and uh, you know, stupid rug pulls. Or worse, they give their money to a centralized entity like Celsius or BlockFi or so many other horrible centralized entities that Bitcoin was invented to get rid of. But because the stupid protocol can't generate you any yield, you end up giving your keys to somebody else. And that's how Mt. Cox got their 140,000 coins. And that's how the Finex hacker got their 70,000 coins. Because the protocol is such trash. Oh, and by the way, all you guys that promote margin trading, you're helping these centralized entities take keys out of people's hands. 
You're getting one guy on one side of the screen to pretend that he knows what's going to happen and, and take another guy's money. You got two guys on two different ends of the same screen trying to steal each other's money. And in the middle is the guy reaping all the rewards, like the recently convicted or settled with the government uh, BitMEX founders. Those guys have got an insurance fund with, I don't know, 30,000, 50,000 Bitcoin in it. And it's really just their money. It's their retirement fund. They don't have to use it for insurance. And how do they get their 30 or 50,000 Bitcoin? By everyone on YouTube promoting margin trading, telling you this fantasy that if you just learned a little bit more, you could go take other people's money from them. How honest and beautiful. And all it does is make the trading companies rich, the exact opposite. Those are the new banks. The new banks are the, the people that give you margin. The new banks are the exchanges. And actually, the new banks are the governments that have seized all these coins from the hackers and the criminals. And so what solves this? A lot of things solves this. Tornado Cash solves this. It gives you actual anonymity and privacy. You don't have to get wrecked by the government or lose all your privacy. If you're a business, you don't have to let everyone know what you pay all your customers. You don't have to let everyone know what you pay your employees. You don't have to let everyone know what you pay your suppliers because you need actual privacy to function in the world, which is why it's a human right. And Bitcoin doesn't offer it. Bitcoin's also at the top of its S curve. The richest man in the world already bought and dumped on your heads. Governments have already made it legal tender. Insurance companies have already bought it. Everyone already bought it. It's traded in the most liquid exchange in the history of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And hundreds of millions of dollars are traded every single day. And guess what? You're late. It's 13 years old. You're not an early adopter, which is why it's cheaper now than it was five years ago. You sat on your Bitcoin for five years at a loss. Piece of crap, garbage, trash asset that's the slowest, most expensive database in the world. You can't, you, when the blocks fill up, and by the way, I've waited six hours for a transaction and you can't fix it. And, and, and there's no roadmap. They haven't added features in five years. And they've had two critical vulnerabilities where anyone could mint as many free coins as they wanted. And one time they did. Somebody minted six billion extra Bitcoin and they had to roll the chain back. And then a couple of years ago, three years ago, a Bitcoin Cash developer, Bitcoin Cash, that thing down 98% versus Bitcoin, 99% actually, that thing, one of their developers found a critical vulnerability in Bitcoin that would have let anyone mint as many free coins as they wanted. They respectably and honorably and responsibly disclosed it instead of just minting as many free coins as they wanted. And then Blockstream lied and said it was, uh, it was a uh, denial of service patch they were releasing. But really, it was a denial of service patch plus a anyone could mint as many free coins as they want. And how many coins have had that problem? XLM had that problem. Ravencoin had that problem. Monero had that problem. AVAX had that problem. But you know what coin is not ever going to have that problem that all those other coins have had, including Bitcoin twice? Hex. Do you know why? because it's a safe within a safe. Our consensus code is locked and isolated in a place where no one can ever possibly touch it ever. But the Bitcoin code, it gets modified and changed all the time. Little tiny fixes they tried to do. They tried to make the latency on the network a little bit quicker that introduced that last bug. That last inflation bug that would have let anyone mint as many free coins as they wanted was introduced by a Bitcoin developer trying to make the network stack a little better because it's spaghetti code. And if you try and change one thing or improve one thing, it breaks everything because the consensus touches the wallet, touches the network. It's trash and there's no written spec, which is why you don't get multiple implementations. No one, no one wants to use them because they're not bit for bit bug compatible. So what you've got in Bitcoin is limp, weak gains. It dumps just as hard as everything else. Bitcoin dropped 75%. Ethereum dropped 85%. Hex dropped 95%. And when they go to get up, which one do you think is going to get up the hardest? Bitcoin's too heavy. There's no, it's the top of its S curve. If you buy it now, you're getting limp gains with the same drops. It's a risk on asset. And as long as inflation rates are increasing, Bitcoin price will continue to go down along with the prices of almost everything else. You know, Hex went up 30X the last time Bitcoin died from 65K when I, tied, when I called the top on the day. And that top call has been in profit every single day for the last year and a half. Every single day for the last year and a half, except one, the Judas candle, the 69K, 6% higher high. They got all these guys telling you about technical analysis long the top and then wrecked and liquidated. Three Arrows Capital liquidated. Willie Wu liquidated. Uh, Michael Saylor at a loss. Elon Musk, I think Tesla lost 9% on their Bitcoin play. All these losers are losing money left and right while I'm God mode giving away this information for free, handing out free coins. Hex was free for Bitcoiners. Pulse Chain is free for Ethereum people. I'm giving out free coins, free advice, living the dream. All these guys are losers compared to me. I don't know why you would ever listen to any of them. So for, for, for Tony, I'm going to give you the mic now. Uh, for other panelists that want to speak, feel free to put your hand up.
So I appreciate you meeting while Richard. Before, uh, and- before, before we uh, move over to Tone, Richard, you keep mentioning the two Bitcoin inflation bugs, and you mentioned it on the Coin Coin Telegraph debate that you guys had with uh, Tone. I think this was two years ago. Could you like educate the uh, audience on what they were and how they affect BTC as well? Yeah, sure. So the hardest part of a blockchain is just making sure that no one mints any extra free coins. That's the whole game. Like. The whole reason blockchains are useful is because it's mathematically guaranteed supply increase. So all proof of work currencies inflate to secure their networks. Unfortunately, in the case of Bitcoin, the more popular it gets, the more value it gets, the more proof of waste you have to do to defend that value, the more the environment gets blown up. Now, two thirds of that energy is renewable, but guess what? When you suck up all the renewable energy, then the guys, like they just had to turn off all the mining in Texas because the grid was full. And then the Bitcoin guys are like celebrating, like, hey, we turned our machines off. What good citizens we are. And you're like, bro, if you wouldn't have them on, you wouldn't have to turn them off. It's like having to borrow your lawnmower back from your neighbor. You lend your lawnmower to your neighbor and he's had it so long that now you have to beg him to get it back. And it's just the same thing with electricity, you know? And if they would stop blowing up the environment, they would stop murdering the price because we know proof of stake systems work or you'd see them getting hacked all the time. They never get hacked. The, the, the networks that have all these bugs that I'm telling you about were like Ravencoin, for instance. A hacker minted 10% of the Ravencoin supply at once from an inflation bug and dumped it on exchange. So proof of work systems are extremely buggy and they're not buggy from the perspective that they need more hash rate. They're buggy from the perspective of software bugs. And software bugs are a function of attack surface. And the more spaghetti code you have and the less modularity you have and the less isolation you have, the more of these huge, these huge, like world ending bugs you're going to get. So, you know, when they minted six billion extra Bitcoin by accident in 2010, they just rolled the chain back and we're like, ah, oops, we'll just pretend it didn't happen. That guy that minted the six billion extra, we're just not going to give it to him. And that's what that's what uh, that's what the Ethereum guys did back when Ethereum was big enough to just do whatever they wanted or small enough to do whatever they wanted. Some guy like ran a smart contract and jacked everybody for their money. They said code was law until someone actually used the code to take their money. And then they said, oops, code's not law. We're forking the chain. Ha ha. And then they rolled the chain back with a default vote. Like if no one voted, it just defaulted to taking away the quote hacker's money. But is he really a hacker if he just did what the code let him do? Right. And so like Bitcoin is the same thing. They have a they have an inflation bug that lets some guy mint an extra six billion Bitcoin. But they're like, "Ah, actually, we don't want you to have that six billion. We're going to take it back from you. And so when it happened to let three years ago, the guy that found it, the Bitcoin cash guy, he could have just minted as many free Bitcoin as he wanted. That's it. He would just perform a transaction on the network that would have put an extra million Bitcoin into his wallet or 10 million Bitcoin or 100 million Bitcoin. Because basically they, they made a mistake when upgrading the network to try and make it faster, to make the networking stack faster, less latency. They introduced a bug that let anyone mint as many free Bitcoin as they wanted. Now, Ethereum's never had that bug. And Hex is, un- Hex is less likely to have that bug than either Ethereum or Bitcoin because our consensus code doesn't touch anything else. It's locked and isolated and modular. And so, like, it, it's, it's like this is the bug that bites everybody. The only other kind of bug that bites everybody is 51% attacks. And they really only happen to proof-of-work coins that have quite small mining minority hash rate. And that's the reason ERC-20s never have 51% attacks on them, but small minority coins do. Like, uh, oh, I can't, I don't remember some of these little small coins that have had these problems, but so long story short, when every time you try to improve Bitcoin, there's a chance you break it and make it a lot worse every single time because it's spaghetti code. And it's run by barely any guys. Peter Wule, who's 80% of the commits to Bitcoin, just gave up his keys. He no longer can make commits on GitHub. He gave up his keys. Gavin Anderson, who uh, Satoshi Nakamoto handed control to, abandoned the Bitcoin project as well. He works on uh, zero cash stuff on side Ethereum. B- Bitcoin Jesus, he used to love Bitcoin. He left Bitcoin. I left Bitcoin. Everyone ends up leaving Bitcoin because Bitcoin doesn't care about you. It doesn't love you. And the second that the Bitcoin community sees that you're successful anywhere else, they will demonize you and make you the worst person in the world. Ask Trace Meyer. Ask uh, me. Ask Gavin Anderson, ask Bitcoin Jesus, Roger Ver, ask any of us who are some of the most, you know, powerful people in the space. We've all abandoned Bitcoin because Bitcoin abandoned us. When Bitcoin.org was hacked and a scam was on the homepage, did Satoshi come and do an emergency live stream to save Bitcoiners? No, but I did. 
because I care more than he does. Nah, and when's is... the last time? When's the last time Satoshi gave you free coins? I give you free coins. He doesn't. Satoshi's dead or a coward? Vitalik's on stage every day. Where's Satoshi? This is stupid. Uh, so I'll, money I'll... is supposed to be a commodity. It's not supposed to care about you. It doesn't have consciousness. It's a it's an unconscious commodity. It's not supposed to be biased. It's supposed to be neutral money. That is the precise problem with hex, and that is why Bitcoin is better than hex. It's unbiased, neutral money. It's a tool. So the so hex is up two hundred and fifty so x versus Bitcoin round two fifty. So, so Shane McShane, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak. Thanks for joining as well. Tony, you've been waiting patiently. I see Munib as well with his hand up and Wendy, and I'll let you guys speak in a bit and bullish as well. Um, so, Tony, um, you've been very respectful muting your mic. So, I appreciate you being here. So, Do you want to give the uh, audience I mean, first, introduce the audience, you're, you're, you're Richard, you and Richard, you go way back. So, just to t touch on that because a lot of people don't know that. And then address the points made by Richard, especially about Bitcoin and Sean touched on X as well. Hey Mario, uh, like, honestly, I, I really don't mind Wendy and Munib going in front of me if uh, if they're gonna be quick. But then when I finally get a chance to talk, I expect uh, Richard to stay on mute the way I did. Otherwise, this makes no sense. And this debate is gonna be very frustrating because 80% of what Richard said is like a lie. Uh, do I address the, the, the inaccuracies of his argument or do I address the assuming that Richard is right, even though it's pure bullshit? Do I address it that like he's wrong? On, uh, like, like, I don't even know how to debate something when half the things he says are just factually wrong. Like, do I debate the facts or do I debate the concept? I have absolutely no idea. So let me think about that as I let Wendy and Munib say something. So, sure. So, Ton, I'll let you, I'll let you prepare your arguments. And, yeah, Richard, will mute. And, so, and Ton's and dialing a friend right now. He's calling all his and, homies. Uh, okay. So, so um, I'll let uh, Wendy, Munib go first. And then, Wendy, if you want to put your hand up again, if you want to, if you want to speak, because your hand is down now. But, Munib, I'll give you the mic and then bullish. And then, McShane, if you want to also speak before we give the mic to, uh, to, to Ton. I have to I have to leave. So I just wanted to tell everybody I love and respect you all. And I hope that everybody can have a nice, respectful or actually a nice, decent conversation because decency is the bare minimum. Um, and that's all. So just again, you guys do what works for you. Be respectful to each other. And everybody's entitled to their opinion. And I'm learning a lot from both Tone and Mr. Richard Hart. Um, and that's all. And I'll be live streaming if you'd all want to hop over to my channel. But anyway, sending everybody love and light and keep the debate going. But be decent. Okay, bye. Thanks, Wendy. Um, you, Wendy. So, 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 Munib, I'll give you the mic. And thanks for being here. I'll let you introduce yourself very briefly as well before uh, discussing the points Richard made. Sure. Uh, I think very, very quick intro for people who don't know who I am. I've been in the Bitcoin space since around 2013. Uh, my background is distributed systems. I did a PhD in computer science at Princeton. Uh, and my, my quick comments, I, 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 I actually didn't even know what the debate was going to be about, but I would plus one tone that I think there were so many different types of inconsistencies and weird kind of, kind of like, I wouldn't call them lies, but basically just misrepresentation of things that I don't even know where to begin, right? Like, I, I'll just pick like one small thing so we can make it a little bit concrete. Like, for example, uh, there seems to be an argument here that uh, proof of work currencies are somehow uh, worse at the inflation type of a bug. Like, there's basically no correlation there, right? Like these types of bugs, uh, all, all of these different blockchains are basically software, they're code. Any type of code can have bugs. And if anything, if there's open source code that has been out there running in public for more than a decade, then a lot of hackers have actually tried hacking it. A lot of people have actually tried breaking it. So if anything, Bitcoin has a much lower probability of, of having bugs than, than, than anything else. But absolutely, there's no correlation between a proof of work currency and the software used to implement it with bugs. Like that, that's just not how, how, how the software works. R reality doesn't agree with you. Just Google critical vulnerabilities Bitcoin. It's really that simple. The facts are on my side. They publish CVE lists. The developers, which you love so much, publish critical vulnerability that's, reports. That's, that's, that's how software development works, right? Like that, this, is, this is basically, I think it's a known thing that Ethereum, for example, has a much more complex code base than Bitcoin. Bitcoin is simple by default. It only does one thing, right? You can only do very simple transactions with Bitcoin. Any computer scientist would, would agree with me that Ethereum is a much more complex code base than Bitcoin, right? You're, you're pointing to a strange thing that happened in 2010 that was very responsibly handled 
to make a point that is really there to confuse people who don't know computer science that well. And most of Bro, are you crazy? 2019 is not 2010. Three years ago is not 2010, is it, buddy? I don't think you know what you're talking about. I'm, I'm talking about the 2010 bug that you keep referring to, right? The, the yeah, and, and, and I care less about that it. one. I care much less about that one than the very recent one that was done by the same guys that are still currently working on the software. Blue Matt, the guy that introduced that bug, is still working on the Bitcoin software. You're just fantasizing. I listed you a bunch of proof-of-work coins that have had software inflation bugs. Now, you list me the proof-of-stake ones. Go ahead. Yeah, because you don't know anything. Most, 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 most of the, these small projects, nobody even care about it enough to actually go and exploit these bugs. Right? Like you're, you're making a claim that at the software level basically makes no sense. No engineer would agree with you. You, so you don't have a problem with anyone minting as many free Bitcoin as they want. That's cool with you. Uh, no, no, no one is saying that, right? And okay, so you support Bitcoin's, you support Bitcoin's, the bug Bitcoin's, bounty Bitcoin's, program at Bitcoin. Then then. Speak, uh, listen, I'm speaking right now, so maybe you can be you can let other people a chance to speak. What I'm saying right now is the Bitcoin code base is actually very simple because Bitcoin is a simple protocol. It has been there for ten plus years. It has the most number of eyes on it. The most number of hackers have actually tried breaking it because it has it is by far the largest asset class out there. So people can make the most amount of money if they can break Bitcoin. If people have Muneeb, not, how many months does it take to onboard a new developer? I'm not I'm not done speaking. When you were talking, people were, were quiet. Right? So you can you can do the same to the I other asked you a well. question to get you to talk. Quit being not, so sensitive. I'm not I'm not I'm not done done speaking, right? So when I'm done, please you can ask your question after that. So going back to the fact that Bitcoin code base has been there for 10 plus years, people have the most amount of incentive to go and hack Bitcoin because they can steal the most amount of money by doing that. They don't care about the small random project, right? Because there isn't a lot of money there. There isn't a lot of liquidity there. Even if you steal something, it's, it's, it's like low stakes, right? Nobody cares. Bitcoin is the prime target. It's the largest asset class, the most liquid thing out there. And it has been there for more than a decade, right? Hackers have tried, other people have tried, and it is by far the most stable thing out there. So just coming here and making an argument that because it's proof of work, somehow you can create inflation bugs at the code level, as a computer scientist, no engineer would ever agree with you that there's any correlation. There. Buddy, the, the people that introduced the bug were on the Bitcoin core dev team. They weren't hackers. Second, there, there, how there, many there, months there, does it there, take? There, specifically about that bug, okay? Richard is blowing down. Okay, look, every uh, as Muneeb said, uh, every piece of code can have a bug. Everything gets a bug. How did that bug get introduced into Bitcoin? A while ago, uh, I think it was Matt Carello who, in review of the code, they uh, decided that this certain piece of code was not needed in the Bitcoin protocol. A little later, there was an update to the code. No problem. A little later, there was an update to that update that needed a dependency on what was added prior. No problem. After that, there was another addition to the code that added that now needed those two dependencies. And then later on, something else got added that needed those things, but also needed the thing that happened to be removed. So there's two things there. First of all, this bug was never exploited. And it would have been so theoretical to exploit it. The problem that the Bitcoin network faces, because Bitcoin network doesn't have a single godlike leader, unlike some other chains, including Hex, because Bitcoin is this decentralized protocol, there is no one to speak for Bitcoin. No one speaks for the internet itself. About six years ago, there was a very critical bug in the, in the, in the internet protocol, the whole internet. The entire internet was in jeopardy. Very few internet developers, uh, the TCP IP layer developers, they all got together in secret and they knew this bug existed and they had to fix it before the entire internet could have been exploited. Everything, every single website, every single thing. They fixed it, you can Google this by the way, I think it was about a decade ago, uh, maybe less, maybe like seven years ago. They fixed it in secret because very, because very few people knew it was there. And they basically saved the entire internet from being taken down. These things happen. The same thing was ha happened there in Bitcoin. There was this small theoretical bug that someone could have potentially exploited that the miners would have probably rejected and nodes would have probably rejected those coins the way it happened in 2010. In 2010, 
all those coins were minted and uh, there was a soft fork and everyone's known said, no, 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 we don't accept those all those new coins. The same exact thing would have happened if by some 0.0001% chance, someone could have successfully exploited that bug. The, the problem that, the problem that, uh, one second, I, I got a call. Let me just say I'll call back. Uh, we'll call back. I uh, can't. Okay, so um, so the problem with Bitcoin is that the Bitcoin developers are super honest. That honesty gets them the wrath of people like Richard Hart, okay? And that's the problem. So in Bitcoin, you have these developers that say, you know, there is a 0.1% chance that a 0.1% chance that this minor thing could potentially be exploited. And that statement gets blown so out of proportion because there is no PR department. On the flip side, you have a project like Ethereum or a project like Hex or any other project where there was like a 30% chance that this is this ridiculousness is 90% chance probability that it's going to be exploited. And they sit there, go on TV and say, nope, not gonna happen, no way in hell. OK, so they make these bold claims and that's why there are 5000 of these shit coins. No one cares about them. And then when they blow up, they just say, oh, it was a science experiment. No big deal. OK, so so Bitcoin suffers from the fact that everyone in Bitcoin is super honest and everyone that quits Bitcoin like Gavin Andreessen, like Roger Veer, like everyone else is because they have this God complex that Bitcoin has to do exactly what they want it to do. And when this protocol you know, goes in its own direction, they throw up their hands and print their own money. This is continuing to happen all the time. And that's why these people lose all respect from the Bitcoin community. Well, look, man, I think something like 3% of all Bitcoin holders claimed their free hex, literally provably on chain. Second, regarding miners rolling back the hack transaction, all you have to do is cut the miners in on the fraud. So if you give the miners 5 or 10%, you get to keep all of it. They're not going to roll it back on you. Third, I think it's funny that guys that have had two mint as many as you want bugs and a long list of other critical vulnerabilities, I might add, whereas Ethereum has had none. And like, I just, you have no anonymity in Bitcoin, you have anonymity in Ethereum. You have slow transactions in Bitcoin, you have fast transactions in Ethereum. You have these NFTs. Are just wrong. And these it's are just, like, these are not true. No, 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 tell me, tell wrong. me, educate me, educate me. I'm listening. Tell me you're going to tell me more than it's just wrong. Like, tell me. It's essential. Ethereum is a centralized security. Like, the vulnerability is the project itself. Like, you're actually. But Shane, your, 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 your audio is super low, bro. Can you speak, like, closer to the mic? Because I don't think the audience can hear you. Uh, sorry, I actually sorry. hear him okay. Yeah, see, yeah, yeah Doug. You, can, you used can, to be able to get 2,000 Ethereum for one Bitcoin. Now you can get, like, what, like 500 maybe or 50 or something? Okay. Huh? I don't know, dude. Can Seems can like Ethereum did pretty good. Bitcoin, Sarah. Like, your yeah, strategy can, can, of arguing is so on, interesting. Uh, like, it's so frustratingly false and misleading. Yeah, but use your words, buddy. Use your words. You got the mic. Tell me. Give me details so I can crush you. I can, I can give you the details. I think uh, Ethereum has had a lot more chain splits which are a critical consensus problem than Bitcoin. Like you can you can go look it up and let's let's dive into it. So why why is Ethereum having more chance splits than Bitcoin? Usually because they did the stupid thing of multiple uh, clients, which I don't actually like. Ethereum Ethereum has proved that if there is a big exploit and you actually steal a bunch of Ethereum, the centralized Ethereum foundation will just roll it back. False because Polkadot proved that's not true. That used to be true years ago but Polkadot lost 150 million worth and no one bailed him out and the guy that founded that project wrote solidity the guy that founded that project wrote the ethereum software itself so the like if they were going to ever bail anyone out ever again they would have bailed out what's the, the market what's the what's the market cap of ethereum it's usually i think like uh, a third of bitcoin which is what well i mean i don't know 250 billion maybe right so what's 150 million it's nothing well, I mean, I don't know, man. The guy founded it, right? He's an insider. It'd be easy to just do the same thing they did last time, but I don't insider, think they're going to do it. He, he was an insider, but then he quit to print his own money like every other insider of Ethereum except Vitalik. I, I just don't think they can roll back the chain, bro. I don't think I think it's too wide now. I think it's too many people. But, but I think rolling back the chain <laughs> is a separate issue, right? The discussion here was that which code base is more complex 
and can have yeah, more you're totally wrong about that. It takes nine months to on-ramp a new Bitcoin Core developer as per the Bitcoin Core guys themselves, which means it's extremely complex code and you just don't know what you're talking about. It's it, 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 because you have to make sure you don't do something stupid. So you want to learn the whole code base. Like in Ethereum, you can just go and start programming right now. No one cares. No, I think, I think maybe, maybe there's, the one, there's one guy on this the... call who actually knows about software and it's me. So I don't, I don't know why you trader guys think you know so much. You don't. So, so go, ahead. Vitalik go ahead. Go ahead. Himself, look, Vitalik himself admits that Ethereum base layer and code base is more complex than Bitcoin. But Richard here, Hey, how much wallet. Bitcoin consensus has a $250,000 bug bounty program for Ethereum. How much is the Bitcoin uh, core bug bounty program? Well, Bitcoin, well, where is the money? Okay, Richard, get, where people, is the money? Where, where is the money coming from, right? It's great when you have people printing their own money like yourself, have Chain all this labs. money to pay other people. Chain code labs. Chain code labs can pay it. They pay all the devs already. Where do they get the money? Chain code labs is doing all your dev for free already anyway. They could also have a bug bounty program. Why don't you crowdfund it? You could get 250k, dude. Do go do it. Make Bitcoin better. All right, all right. Are, are people noticing that Richard switches topic every time he's wrong on something? Like oh, he every first sentence. tried he, 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 You he, mean every time, right? He, he he first tried saying that you know Bitcoin can have more bugs and when I started talking about chain spets, he forgot forgot about it, started talking about something else, right? Then, I was talking about we a were, bug bounty program not then, relevant to bugs. Then then we were talking about like, hey, is Ethereum code more complex? I brought up that Vitalik himself admits that Ethereum code is more complex, right? He didn't answer that. He started talking about something else. I, I think Ethereum's code is more complex, but that doesn't make so it less secure. It just makes it a different failure mode. It's not all complex complexity leads to the secure. same type of failure. Right, Listen, not complex, all more, types more of... Secure. Not all types of complexity lead to the same form of failure. You could say that Hex is more complicated than Ethereum because it's built on top of Ethereum, but that complication makes it less likely to have an inflation bug. Okay, so you not all complexity in the anti security. How, that, how can that be a true statement? That makes no sense at all. Bro, it's like putting a safe in a safe. Zero sense to an engineer. It makes zero sense to an engineer. It's basically this type of language only speaks to people who don't understand Doug. code Doug. And, and computer science. Just, like, just relax. I'm going to explain it to you in a way you understand, okay? If you have a safe and you put another safe inside it, that's more secure, right? And this is logic for Two more. safes is, is more secure than one safe, right? So when you take a part of the code that's really important to you and you make it isolated and locked so that no one can ever edit it, it's that more is a, secure. That, that is a lie. That is impossible to do. Well, like, no, it's not. Like, that's by like definition what a smart contract without admin keys is. We, no one believes you that you don't have admin keys to everything in Hex. No one in the world believes you except people that only listen to your bullshit on it. I would add this also isn't about Hex. Hex is worth four cents. No one gives a fuck Guys, about every Hex. ERC-20 without admin here. keys has the same security property. It has nothing to do with Hex. It just happens to be that if you take your consensus code and lock it in a smart contract and it doesn't have admin keys, then it is more secure than Ethereum itself from an inflation bug perspective. And it is more secure than Bitcoin itself from an inflation bug perspective because both Bitcoin and Ethereum do not have their consensus code for counting how many coins exist locked and isolated, which, by the way, is why it's so hard to actually figure out what the Ethereum supply is. So you have to okay, run okay, the actual let, let, code. Let, 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 Bitcoin, secure through decentralization, something that Hex and Ethereum both lack. That Huge, decentralization you're... secures you from 51% attacks. It does not secure you from bugs, which is the majority of the consensus failures and proof of work networks. They're bugs, which is why if you cared about security, you would have a bug bounty program and pay auditors like I pay auditors. I've spent more money on auditors for my code than Bitcoin That's spent for their code. That's because you're printing money. Yeah, you've also rugged more people than everyone. <laughs> Yeah, I'm up 250x versus Bitcoin from January 5th of 2020. SMD, please. Your coin and that's is after a fucking cents. huge this dip. This isn't about Hex. This debate is not about Hex. We're not here to I don't care about Hex, but you're you guys need to, to understand Hex. computer security. Better and worse exists, and you're advocating for worse. Okay, well, let, it's me, let, me, let, me, let me back up here. R Richard is trying to make a claim that Bitcoin's biggest problem is inflation bugs in the code. For me, this is not a concern at all. Because if there is one of these bugs that is exploited, 
which is very unlikely, my node would reject those coins. And this is why it's important to run your own node, something you can't actually do on Ethereum or anything built on top of Ethereum. So if if Richard's code has an inflation bug, which he claims it can't, but Munib, the computer science PhD, and myself, who have a background in computer science, have a financial engineering degree, and I did code on Wall Street, we're saying that he can still have an inflation bug. That's a computer science debate. But if he was to have some kind of a code failure, there are no nodes to reject it. He runs the only node. So he can either roll back the chain or there's nobody anybody can do about it. So either it's either his system is actually decentralized in a way that it dies the moment there is a bug, or his system is not decentralized at all and he can save it. In Bitcoin, you guys haven't you noticed Bitcoin, that ERC twenties are like extremely reliable? Like barely anyone ever has problems with bog, that, bog standard ERC twenties. Because they that, work really there's good. a reason for that. That's because Ethereum turned off Turing completeness after the DAO hack. No, they didn't. What are you talking about? You still have Turing complexity. It's an EVM. It's a virtual machine. You can do add, subtract, divide, multiply. You, you can do whatever you Congratulations. want. Congratulations. You can do fifth grade math. No, but you can do options. You can do time deposits. You can do peer-to-peer -peer trading with no middlemen, which Bitcoin can't. You can do stable coins. You can do algorithmic stable coins. Which Bitcoin can run a node, which is the most, which is the only thing that matters in a blockchain is whether you can run a node. I can reject coins from an inflation bug. No, but that's you never it. will, and that's not true because you run the code that the core devs give you, and you don't compile it yourself, and you don't verify that it doesn't send your keys off to them, and you wouldn't know where to look for that underhanded C++ code if they put it in there, which is why you can look up underhanded C as a contest where people compete to inject malicious bugs into otherwise very clean-looking C code, and very, very hard is it to get up to speed with C++, which is what Bitcoin Core runs. The Bitcoin so, D EXE is, is, is C++ code. You're going to do by default whatever the dev shoved down your throat, so, but so, you as a non-dev don't have a choice. Your so node Richard, is never going to do Richard, anything different from anyone else's node ever. Richard uh -oh. is making the... Yeah, okay. Well, one last point. One last point. I'll, I'll give you the floor. <clears throat> Richard is making the claim that the most open uh, code base uh, with some of the most uh, honest, articulate developers that have been super public about everything, that have a history of coding projects uh, to protect people's privacy and like basically have very anti-government, tyrannical mental views uh, on that whole situation. That this group of developers uh, is somehow more malicious than one or two developers you've never even heard of who you don't even know their names in all these other crypto projects who you who may or may not be uh working for the government who may or may not have been infiltrated to the government who are coding like and no one is even checking their shit he's saying that those developers are to be trusted more than the group of bitcoin core good luck i don't with that think argument. the bitcoin I'm guys are malicious it. at all i don't think they're malicious at all i think it's just spaghetti code and hard to work with c plus plus is hard to work with Bitcoin's hard to work with. That's why it takes nine months before you can even start to make your first commit at Blockstream. Go watch the interviews. I don't understand you guys. You say Bitcoin's simple, and then I prove it's not, and you get mad. I say I say bug bounty programs are good, and Ethereum has one, and then you're just like, uh, centralized. No, just go uh, raise the money uh, and have a fucking uh, uh, bounty program. Richard, you're, you're, you're also talking about how easy it is to stick a bug into Bitcoin, and then you're talking it's about not, how hard it is it's, to, it's easy to, to add not, into Bitcoin. It, it's you're very hard to not stick a bug. You just said it yourself using your own words that it takes a long time to on-ramp a new dev because you want to make sure he doesn't screw something up. You and I agree with this. You and I agree with software is hard and that you should have really smart people doing it. And you gave a weird straw man where you accused me of accusing the devs of being evil. I don't think they're evil at all. I think everyone that writes open source software is a very nice person. They could go make more money in the private sector. I think open source devs are amazing. You know who's still writing open source software? Vitalik. Me. Satoshi's not, and half the Bitcoin core devs are leaving. Like Peter Woolley just dropped his access. Gavin left. I mean, they're leaving left and right. It's a, it's a tragedy of the commons. Like you guys are, the reason you'll, like, where's the anonymity in Bitcoin? And you want anonymity and I want anonymity and we agree on this point and it'd be great if they actually added it. Where is it? It's been 13 years. The roadmap is pitiful, man. And you're going to say, next you thing you're going to say is, add, that makes Bitcoin better. It makes Bitcoin better than it can't make. There you go. I beat you to it. It's better that Bitcoin can't add anything because it makes it more secure, even though it has a giant list of critical vulnerabilities. 
What yeah, makes so Bitcoin I, I secure think, is the fact that you can't just add random shit. All right, Muneeb, go for it. Yeah, I think I think I want to make two points here. The first point is that this uh, idea of uh, the security of Bitcoin, like there, at the end of the day, there's always a social consensus there, right? Uh, and how decentralized a, a, a ecosystem or blockchain is falls back to the social consensus. And in Bitcoin, you do have the most grassroots, uh, die-hard people who believe in decentralization. And so changing the 21 million Bitcoin cap is basically unthinkable. Just, just from the fact that people... Richard, gonna, Richard uh, I'll let uh, you, uh, just quickly, Richard, Richard, I'll let you mute so we can hear Muni, just if you don't mind muting, Richard. There's a background noise. Bro, my right. mic has been off forever. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I heard Dre. I, can I think it was yeah, someone else. Oh. Yeah, I think it's, oh, it's someone else. Raining, yeah. it, it's raining in the background for me. Maybe maybe that's what you're Oh, okay, cool, cool. My bad. I see, yeah, I see Muneeb, Muneeb constantly transmitting, but not like Muneeb's got mic indicator always. All right, go ahead, Muneeb. Yeah, so I think the, the first thing is the social consensus there, which is what, what Joan was talking about. I think super important. The second thing is, I, I, I believe Richard's main argument is that somehow publishing a smart contract and then throwing away the keys is more secure than the, the type of code that Bitcoin has. I, I think the counter fact of that is like smart contracts upgrade all the time. You have Uniswap V1, you have Uniswap V2, you have Uniswap V3. P the same people can publish a new contract and just tell everybody, hey, here's the new contract code that you have to follow. And people do this all the time. On, on yeah, but that's a, that's a superior security model that was actually very innovative and the same one that I came up with. Everyone that makes a smart contract could include admin keys and introduce middleman security, beg some other guy not to do something evil. The right way to do security is to make the individuals upgrade their node and use social consensus to choose what the safe thing is. Uniswap V1 chose not to have their keys and make everyone else go through the hard work of moving all their liquidity manually and all their trading manually to a new system. It's a superior security model. So not having admin keys is what crypto was designed around and having to force everyone to do that work to verify that they're on the real thing is the most secure thing you can have, which is by the way, those systems have operated perfectly flawlessly for years. Bitcoin hasn't. Bitcoin has had, an, like, I just, I don't understand why you guys are so mad at reality. Your devs on your team injected a bug, and now you're yelling at me like it's my fault. Your devs right. on your team I, I injected a bug. It's your people, problem. What, what, what people are, are, are pushing back on is the misrepresentation that somehow there was some big problem with Bitcoin, right? There's Whereas big problems all the time, but you guys just don't read the CVE reports. Bitcoin only got Bitcoin only, got, I do. I do. Bitcoin I do. only got stronger when that bug got fixed. I don't understand how Richard is saying yeah, it's yeah, a bad exactly. thing. This is a good much, thing. Much it's a good that it got fixed. It's just spaghetti code that's happened. likely to get more bugs. Much that doesn't mean it's spaghetti code that's likely that doesn't prove anything. All any. the time, all the time, right? So he's over exaggerating a relatively small thing on a very secure system. And basically play around with this idea that somehow smart contracts are more secure. They're not. Yes, they have a property that once you publish it and throw away the admin keys, you can change that contract. But the people who publish the smart contract can publish a new one. And 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 Hex, I haven't looked that deeply into Hex. It's not kind of like on the... Please don't. Mind, mind I, I for, think for, it's for, better for, that you guys don't even again? talk about Hex. It's too confusing for you guys. It's better we just talk about Ethereum. But, no, that, but that, 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 this is how th this is what makes it popular. It's too confusing for anyone. It's uh, no it's, okay. It's, it's literally hex is just Bitcoin with a proof of work change. We use ETH miners and we inflate to get people to lock their coins instead of blow up the environment with SHA two five six. That's it. That's oh all it is. God. It's not hard. So you just don't think about like Bitcoin innovation that keeps coming back up. That hey, Bitcoin doesn't innovate. The architecture there is that the base layer is simple. The base layer is not going to change. It's hard money. And, and, and people like that. And then there are Bitcoin layers, right? I work on one of them, right? There are all sorts of Bitcoin layers. Lightning is one, Stacks is one, RSK is one. There, there are new ones coming up like, uh, the, like the sidechain on Cosmos. And that's where experimentation happens. If yeah. you want more privacy, if you want tornado cash like stuff, you would publish that on a Bitcoin layer. Stacks could do it. Well, and Liquid you, Liquid yeah. Liquid has it as well. Uh, all transactions inside the Liquid sidechain have uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, they're, oh, they're confidential, tra tra confidential transactions. Right. Thank you. Hey, do you run a Liquid node, Ten? I don't at the moment because I travel too much, but I plan to when I uh, take some time off. And don't re you have to pay someone for a hardware security module to run a Liquid node? Yes, Liquid is federated, but Stacks is not. Stacks is permissionless.
I don't need to run a liquid node. I can choose to if I want to. Uh, I would I rather run to. Bitcoin than a liquid node, truthfully. So, so Richard, I have a question for you. You were you were a big supporter of Bitcoin. You explained why your perspective changed. What are what are things you agree with uh, when talking about Tonum? Uh, you know, we had things that you guys agreed on earlier in the space without knowing, without being in the space at the same time. You made similar points. What are points you'd agree with that that were mentioned by Munib, uh, Toyn, Tone, or, or Shane? So if you're worried about 51% attacks, then the network that has the highest hash rate is most secure about that. That would be Bitcoin. If you're worried about being able to buy a billion dollars at once and not move the price, that would be Bitcoin. If you're worried about regulatory certainty and being uh, uh, registered as uh, you know legal tender in El Salvador, that would be Bitcoin. If you want to put a laser eyes profile and feel good eating steak and, and hang out with other people that only eat steak, that would be Bitcoin. But all of these things has an opposite side. So yes, you can buy a billion and a half dollars of it without moving the price. But guess what? The price doesn't move because if you buy a billion and a half, that doesn't move it. So geez, how much do you have to buy to actually get it to move? You see? And so it's the same thing goes with the fifty one percent of tax stuff. Argument again. Richard is only interested in rugging y'all for USD. He's not interested like there's like no fundamental difference between your project i'm the i'm the self-help the author that gives away free self-help book for years which we, you are not 290 pounds what are you talking about no one is seeking help from you so let me get this straight if michael jordan's coach couldn't dunk him and you couldn't learn from him if a homeless guy in the street tells you to brush your teeth you don't brush your teeth you can leave your fat shaming at home dude i give bitcoiners free money i save bitcoiners from scams i try and make There's bitcoin no more secure free scam. money you I said scam. this. I literally said this to Alex Mashinsky's face in 2019. You cannot give everyone 7% interest. You're running a Ponzi scheme. And there's no difference here. There's Bitcoin no miners make it. Money. Bitcoin miners make that. Where's the Ponzi? It's Bitcoin not miners free. mint air out of thin. I, I've minted Bitcoin. They don't. They Bold. burn electricity. There's a difference. No, it's worse. It's a huge negative externality. But for some reason, you like enriching hardware companies and electric companies. It's silly. They murder the Bitcoin price to buy pollution. Instead, you could just not murder the Bitcoin price and not buy the pollution. And as long as you still have a functioning consensus network, everybody's happy. The only That's time as big as long as no, but as soon I invented <laughs> the term the just in time security. I, in I invented the term just in time security, which means when the government starts kicking down doors and making problems for everyone, you do a proof of work change. If the government started doing SHA-256 mining right now, how would Bitcoin protect itself? With a proof of work change. If the government started knocking down Ethereum miners' doors and making them change transactions, how would you fix that? With a proof of work change. So it's okay, all let, social let consensus anyway. If the government broke down your door and threw you in prison for 20 years, how would Hex perform? It would perform well. I mean, okay, let's let's do that in theory. People think I have eighty five percent of the supply. So if I go to jail forever, who I don't know. Maybe that's like Satoshi going to be dead, right? So the the origin address has never sold a coin, never. But it's, but the Ethereum founder sold coins, and to tell you the truth, I don't know where Satoshi's kids may have put his coins, and I don't know who he had kids with, and I don't know how good his operational endpoint security was. Never sold coins. You're going to pretend really you haven't dumped on your pecs. No, he holders. dumped all the Ethereum that people chain. paid on day one to get his coins. No comment, Tone. Yeah. What about? I got a lot of really cool stuff. I'm selling something for it, ain't I? What about the vulnerability if coins ever become active and all of these OGs? Who do you think Satoshi is? I mean, it doesn't like. I think Satoshi's an English-speaking, rather uh, works at a college kind of guy. Based on a spelling analysis, he puts two spaces after his periods, which means he's one of the last guys to learn a typewriter. So he's probably about my age or older. I'm 42. He spelled a lot of stuff with uh, S-E instead of Z-E, which is an English thing. And if you do timing analysis on the times and when he posted and how quickly he responded to other people, you can't, res quick, you can't respond quickly to other people when you're asleep. So you can actually tell when a guy's awake because he can't cue messages to try and beat the timing analysis. So I think he's an English person on the UK time zone, probably based on the way his code looks, uh, rather noob. You know, he, he wasn't used to working in a dev team. He's kind of doing it on his own. So I want to bring up, we've got a lot of members. So we mentioned Hex. James, I'll give you the mic. I've got a question for, for the panelists. But James, I know you were waiting to speak, so I'll give you the mic. And what about James. if coins start moving? Like, 
all of this Bitcoin's price and everything that's happening right now, like in the, the value of one trillion dollars, is all reliant on the coins not moving. What happens if the coins move? And what about that vulnerability? Like, I feel that's like not every true, man. Coiner just ignores that. Nah, it's not true. We have a number for that called days destroyed. We measure the length of time that a coin has remained uh, dormant. And so if you look on bitinfocharts.com, you just search Bitcoin rich list, you can actually see a chart of how long coins have been sitting there. And, you know, some large amount of coins, which, by the way, is funny. They, market cap supposed to be circulating supply. Circulating supply means moving. Bitcoin's uh, founders, million coins, are sitting there counting as circulating supply, even though they've ever knew, never moved. It's a scam. So actually, Bitcoin's market cap is about 5% lower than publicly advertised because everyone's a scammer. But that, that doesn't matter. Well, why does that matter if Bitcoin's market cap is 5% lower or greater? It fluctuates quite why a bit. Why not just measure it accurately? Why not just measure the coins that have moved that are actually circulating? Why not? Or publish both numbers. I don't mind. Uh, again, bit, there's no CEO of Bitcoin, Richard. This is a this is a coin market cap ranking site thing. This doesn't have to do with go actual to, Bitcoin. Go talk to them. Well, I, like it's a complaint for coin market cap. The website. I've already not, we've already got a lawsuit Bitcoin. against them. I don't think they want to talk to me. So excellent. And by we, so I, I mean bring, Mexicans, not me personally. So I want to bring up. We've got a lot of audience members, uh, Richard, that have come from your community as well. Oh, oh okay. so, going back up. Sorry, 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 sorry. Are you suing coin market cap? Is it because they're not listing hacks? Well, like, like why why are you guys suing them? <laughs> Well, basically, like, malicious tort is when you make uh, problems for someone else's ability to fulfill their contract, and it's actionable. And when you lie and say untrue things, it's actionable. Hex has had billions and billions and billions of dollars of market cap for years, and yet we're put at number 200. And if our price goes down, we're number 200. And if our price goes up, we're number 200. But on the first page, they list things that go to zero, like yams and Luna well, and all types of other disgusting let's clear, trash. Let's be clear, Hex is pretty damn fucking close to zero. It's four cents. Bro, I really hope you get to hang out with some Hexicans sometime. They will really educate you and show you what good life actually looks like. We're driving Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Bentleys, yachts, jets. We're winning the game, uh, period. No. I heard this from one coin. <laughs> the guy with less Bitcoin than me is laughing at me right now. I think that's really funny. Hey, I mined full block solo, no pool, in, in uh, 50 BTC rewards in 2011. How about you, buddy? How much BTC you got, well, dog? Richard, you're not going to win a debate with a Bitcoiner showing them how richer you are. I really don't care how rich you are. I don't have a Lambo. I don't want a Lambo. It's not why I'm here. Clearly, this is why you're here. You didn't make enough money in Bitcoin, so you have to start printing your own. Tone, I retired in 2003 I mean, with 150 yeah. million. Like, oh, Jesus. Dude, it, you, you guys need to go to richardhart.com and learn about who I am. I was a god before Bitcoin was invented. I was retired in 2003. Bitcoin was invented in 2009. Did he just say I was a god before Bitcoin was invented? <laughs> That's right. Correct. And still a god. Fat god. So, any. Uh, Okay, so the, the, I don't even know what to say to that, right? Like, I, I'm following, I like Bitcoin. Just because admit, there is no just admit that Ethereum outpumps Bitcoin three to one since the COVID dip. Just admit it. I, your coin, I, I don't even know how to get in and out of it. Like, I would never do it. Like, it's just, it's just a made up token that you created. It's not interesting. I, to, I told you, Hex is too confusing for you guys. Just talk about Ethereum, it's easier. It is not interesting. It is just another Ponzi, just like Celsius just imploded, just like OneCoin imploded, just like BitConnect. And you know what's funny? We're older than all those things, and yet way. our chart is up 250x versus Bitcoin. Crazy how that works, huh? It doesn't matter how much you're up. The question is, is this sustainable? And it's not because it's just a Ponzi. Dude, it's just Bitcoin with less egg of externalities. We don't have to pay miners to dump the price all the time. It's we don't not. have. We just pay a little bit of fees. People average so, lock so, up seven years. What do you think? Buy. What do you think happens to some people buying lock up seven years? What do you think happens to it? The price goes up. It's obvious. Oh uh, yeah, it's been going down. Yes, you have lots so of just you have lots of Ponzi, you're just explaining a better made Ponzi. Hey, you know what? I don't even, I don't, it's not better. Like the Ponzi is not better. Let, he let me ask you, why isn't Bitcoin a Ponzi? Real quick. To be fair, Tony, why isn't Bitcoin a Ponzi? Better as in it's a better investment. I just meant that by locking it up for seven years, he can hide the fact that it's a Ponzi for longer. Why uh, isn't Bitcoin a Ponzi? Where's its base demand? Where are people uh, using it as a currency? Sure. This was explained in a post by Luke Dash Chewer, another one of those Bitcoin. You mean the guy that keeps begging online world? that can't pay his bills, broke Luke Jr.? The guy yep, that, that the one. guy that is like like yep, nearly that's, that's, 
That's the one, one of the smartest computer engineers uh, alive. And yes, he's not very wealthy. And yes, he needs donations. And he's still one of the smartest computer science people he in wants the world. The, you know, he wants the block size to be 200 kilobits, not one megabyte, right? You know that, yeah, right? He has, he has very good arguments for that, by the way. And whenever Lucas Jr. says anything, people listen. Yeah, I listen and everyone else laughs, including the core devs who are on my side on this one, that Luke is crazy. Uh, well, yeah, the, the lots of geniuses are actually are crazy, and he's one of those, right? And core devs aren't laughing at this. It's seriously being discussed. It's not going to happen. I don't think it's going to happen, uh, but he has good points on that. So in 2013, he explained why Litecoin is just a Ponzi and Bitcoin is not. And the answer was very simple. The reason why Bitcoin is not a Ponzi is because Bitcoin actually innovated something. Uh, because it innovated, it created, uh, it solved the Byzantine generals problem. It, uh, it created, uh, it solved the double spend problem, basically. And now you have unconfiscatable, censorship resistant, digital transfer. And it's capped at 21 million. This so innovation. You say unconfiscatable all the time, and the government confiscates it and sells it all the time. Why do you keep lying like that, man? That's just bad key management. Yeah, 100%. But they, they confiscate it all the time, and you run a show called Unconfiscatable. It's a it's scam, bad it's a lie. Key management. It's bad key management. It's just Dog, bad then key call management. Your thing, then, then rename your conference Good Key Management because you're scamming. The, the, the protocol itself, if you properly secure it, is unconfiscatable. Always said that. Uh, so uh, because Bitcoin actually has an underlying so innovation of decentralization, it prevents Bitcoin from being a Ponzi. Everything else in crypto at the end of the day is pretty much a Ponzi because they haven't innovated anything. So what happens when Ethereum has negative supply growth due to fee burning and switching to proof of stake and Bitcoin is still not even hard money and still inflating to enrich miners to dump the price to pollute the environment? Ethereum and doesn't have, the same thing, by the way. Ethereum doesn't have any actual innovation to the world. So eventually there will be no need for the Ethereum token because everything that you can build on Ethereum, you will be able to build on a side chain of Bitcoin. Moneeb is working on one of them, and there are several others. So everything that Ethereum can do, Bitcoin can also do. That is why the Ethereum token will not be needed, unless Ethereum actually converts itself to be a centralized corporation like Microsoft and converts Ethereum to an equity and stock of the Ethereum, the company. Then so that token has a chance to exist long term. Is the, reason, is the reason there's 10 times more liquidity in wrapped Bitcoin and Ethereum than in the liquid network on Bitcoin because Bitcoin's so cool? Uh, anyone that wraps their Bitcoin on Ethereum doesn't actually believe in Bitcoin and they just want to invest in the latest and greatest thing to try and make more fiat money and eventually they all get burnt. And they all made yield instead of the actual hardcore Bitcoin bros that deposited their coins right into BlockFi and you right only, into Celsius. You, you, only, you only hear from the people that made money on yield. You don't hear from all the people that lost all their money in Luna, all the people that lost all their money in Celsius. These people can uh, probably might not be able to afford internet going forward. So you don't hear from all the failures. You only hear from the successes because they have a bigger microphone. That's why I never hear from your students microphone. because they lost all their money. Your never students never home? talk crap on my posts because they're all wrecked and they don't have anything to talk smack about. Listen, you Richard should stop is, promoting margin trading. It's horrible. Richard, Richard, you're just another version of the core sellers up here. You're up here telling, them, I'll get you rich. I'll sell you something. I got big Lambos. Trust me. Don't trust these guys. Trust me. You're just like, what are you talking about? Fighting. I'm up here talking about Ethereum. I don't even want to talk about my projects. You, I'm not you even talking about my you projects. Yeah, you haven't talked about Hex this entire time. Bro, you came up here and said, I'm a god. Listen to me. My Lamborghinis are huge. And all the people who buy my coin are rich. You're just another version of all these people you're arguing with. Nope. I'm the guy that called the top on the day. Check the charts, buddy. That has nothing to do with what I just said, though. You came up here and said, hey, listen to me. All the people who buy my coin get rich, dude. And then you no, describe I'm the guy getting people to hold their own keys. Listen, you can't remove price risk in speculative instruments. You're going to get bubbles. Things are going to go up and down. That's not removable. But you can remove counterparty risk. I'm the, are, I'm the guy getting people to hold their own keys. That has nothing yeah, to do no, you're still a snake oil salesman. You are just a different type Tone of wants you to give your keys to the exchange. I want you to hold your own keys. Hey, don't trust Easy. These guys. Trust me.
When did I say that? I don't think Tone's ever promoted. <laughs> How are you going to do margin trading and not, uh, I don't know, put your keys on the exchange, bro? you they're gonna get you rich quick listen to me don't listen to them please do not listen to them they are i'm the guy that tells you crypto drops 85 and 95 percent all the time i'm the guy that tells you the honest truth about the volatility go look on hex.com slash scam or how it works and you'll see me tell you 85 95 percent drops all the time nobody Mark, else tells Richard, you, that. you should make it you should make it hey Richard, debate, Richard, can like, you change going on? you Why need to change your anytime talking God, about God. Hex, Mario. Are you gonna we should change the domain to scam.hex.com and stuff Hex.com so, slash scam. So okay. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the mic. I'll give you the mic. Just, oh, hold on, Jay. Before I give you the mic, I just want to say, so we've got audience members, very important panelists to understand. We've got audience members from all different fields, including a lot of Hex um, you know, fans and followers of Richard. We've got a lot of followers of Bitcoin. So I think it's important to also address each audience. So when we Guys, I actually have to run. I'm like, I'm, I hit a hard time stop, but I'd love to do this another time. Probably more like a walk. Uh, yeah, enjoy, bro. See ya. <laughs> Hey, anytime you guys want to get demolished on live stream and get educated, t.me slash Richard Hart, direct message me. I'm happy to educate your audience, and you could do your best to try and educate mine. Uh, James, right. go, you Richard, had your hand what up, tip James? would you give for people in crypto? Like, number one tip. Don't trade. You'll lose all your money. Don't buy scams. Buy things that have product market fit. Bitcoin has product market fit. Ethereum has product market fit. Hex has product market fit. Hold your own keys. Do not use things that have admin keys. You will endure 85 and 95 percent dips. If you give your keys to someone else, you will lose all your money. Uh, also, these things tend to bubble up every three or four years. Maybe it's tied to the fact that the halving occurs every four years. But right now, we have a different macro environment because they're stopped printing money. Bitcoin's only existed previously in a market where they only printed money, so we might have extra downside. Whereas a normal 85% drop from $69,000 would leave you about ten six fifty. dollars Now, because they slowed down the money printing, and it's a risk on asset, and it's dropping with the stock market tied to interest rates, which they have to keep raising because of inflation, you might get a $5,000 downside target for Bitcoin. I hope it doesn't happen. I hope it stops at 85% like it did the last two or three times. And that's it. I'm out. I hope you guys follow me. Twitter.com slash Richard Hart win. Instagram.com slash Richard Hart official and YouTube Richard Hart uh, on YouTube. And I've got free self-help books that have been out for years. that could change your life. T.me yeah, slash okay. Vive. I don't have any paid courses. I don't have any paid anything. You can't possibly send my money. You don't know my address. Good luck and have fun, everybody.